Hey girl, welcome to the Get Your Guide Coaching Podcast. My name is Anwar White, but you can just call me your own personal dating and relationship coach. Each week, you'll hear actionable advice, tips, and strategies that you can implement in your own love life. I'm talking about healing your heart, dating effectively, and understanding men so that you can, you guessed it, get your guy. Are you ready to level up your love life? All right, let's go. I never felt the way I do about anyone but you. Thank you so much for joining my loves. I have a very special guest today. Her name is Stacy Robinson, and she is a dating coach for vulnerable women who are looking to stop dating toxic and unavailable men. So Stacy, yeah. thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about you and what you do specifically? Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so happy to be here. I'm a dating coach to help women to stop dating toxic and unavailable men. And what that really means is the women that are vulnerable are women that have little boundaries, very trusting, almost to a fault. And that resonates with where I was. And I've had several relationships that were toxic. And so my mission now is to kind of help them to overcome the issues that I had. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. I would say so many of the women that I talk to are exactly how you've described those very nurturing types. Like I have a lot of women that I work with that are teachers, that are nurses, that are social yeah. workers, that are all, even hairdressers that are helping and always listening to other people and wanting to take their pain away or help them not struggle in some way, shape or form. So I just think that the work that you're doing is so amazing. I think it's helpful for so many women out there. How did you get into dating, coaching and all of those things? Well, I, I am a nurse and I love helping people. And more specifically, because I've dealt with all these different types of relationships, coaching just really started to kind of draw on me. Again, it was just something that's really a calling. It's really painful for me to see a lot of women, especially my age, Black women, in a lot of loveless relationships, yeah. single moms. And they just really need help in making better decisions and in the choices of men that we have. And this kind of self-sabotaging uh, practices that continue to have us attracting these types of men. So yeah. my mission has always kind of been to overcome the issues that I'm having. And anybody that kind of resonates with me and my message, those are the women that I help yeah. that, that just help them. So that's so funny. Yeah. It's so interesting that you were talking about dating and wellness. And I almost think of them as like similar things because mm -hmm. like dating is emotional wellness and like self wellness. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I think is so interesting is when I speak with women and they become my clients, oftentimes we're not just talking about love and dating. We're talking about mm -hmm. all aspects of their life because how they do one thing is how they do everything. Well-being, right? Just in general. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And how they relate to other people and other parties. So mm -hmm. um, I can understand why you're kind of working in between these two different yeah. worlds because they're so connected. Now, mm -hmm. I know that we had recorded a little bit earlier yeah. and some things had come up. So did you want to kind of share a little bit about what came up for you? Yeah, basically the first time we recorded, I would say I choked. Mommy issues that had kind of come up to the surface when I had told her that I was going to be recording. Yeah. Her response wasn't exactly what I had wanted. And a lot of the issues that I'd have that extend into my adulthood have to do with seeking validation. Yes. So those are issues that I've been working through, but because her response wasn't validating right before we were getting ready to start recording. And I was just kind of sharing with you, yeah. just hindsight, looking back, you didn't say anything. You just kind of let me share. But then it came up again, right when you started asking me just regular questions about how I'm doing and everything. What I realized was after I had fumbled, you started saying, come on, girl, this, you know, you got this, you know, of you're, course. we're just having a conversation and this is your genius. And you were affirming me. Yes. And my mother is critical. Mm -hmm. 
you know, even in this moment, it's hard for me to speak against her. I realized how much that impacted me. And so I couldn't receive the affirmations that you were giving me. All I could hear in my head or see was, you know, what she was saying to me. Mm -hmm. And so that also impacts my choices in men and, you know, had it had impacted my choices in life and and just in general and my whole well-being, as you were saying. So my brand is all about vulnerability and authenticity and sharing my sort of struggles and how I get through that, you know, because we're human, we're not perfect. So just being able to share that is helping someone else as well. So, and that's why we're talking about it on this podcast, because if you're going through something, there are millions of people out there that are also Mm -hmm. going through the exact same thing. And as it shows up and it relates in the dating and the love area and Mm -hmm. sphere, it's dramatic and traumatic, right? Yeah. 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 (laughs) And so we have to talk about these things. We have to talk about some of our toxic and sometimes narcissistic mothers. This is why I speak with specifically Black women. I'm not talking Mm -hmm. about your mother specifically, but I'm talking about the effect and the experience that you have with an individual that is not really affirming you and how that relates to what you look for in terms of affirmation outside Mm -hmm. of yourself, your family and your support circle. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about what that looked like for you when you were growing up, right? If your mom was not necessarily affirming you and giving you the validation that you need that you just spoke about. Well, my mom was a single parent. I was pretty much a latchkey kid, you know, in the 80s. Uh, My dad, he wasn't around. He's a recovering alcoholic and crack addict. You know, I didn't really have any healthy role models or relationships to look up to. Then later on, when I became around 13, my mother got involved with a man that ended up becoming abusive to me and to her. And she was in that relationship until I probably my junior year of college. What did that teach you about loving someone or being with someone? I came from a single mother household too. Mm -hmm. And I'm only asking you this because oftentimes when single mothers are looking for love, they actually come with a lot of desperate energy. And Mm -hmm. with that desperate energy, they actually don't attract high quality men. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about your experience with that. Well, I didn't even know that she had relationship, but for the most part, it was just always me and her. And then because my dad wasn't around, you know, I started having sex really, really early. Okay. And you were having sex early because... Well, it was just kind of the thing to do. I was a late bloomer compared to the friends that I was around because my first time having sex when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls that was around was 14 and she had twins at that time. Wow. I had twins at 31 and it was a hot mess for me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I can only imagine. Right. So your environment was also contributing to like, this is something that happens. Okay. Definitely peer pressure, you know, kind of wanted to be like the other girls. The very first time that I lost my virginity was when I had spent the night over at her house and she was visiting her older boyfriend and I was kind of like a third wheel. So they had to have somebody else there with me. And so I kind of went along to get along Uh and uh, I I didn't really know what I was doing, but just felt like that was the thing to do. And then from that point on, it was kind of like any other relationship that I was involved with. It was like, that's what you do. If you want this boy to be your boyfriend, you have sex with Mm him. Um, and you didn't necessarily know if you were their girlfriend. It just was, you know, you kind of felt like, okay, well, we're, we're having sex and we're kissing or whatever. So you are my boyfriend, Yeah. but then you realize that you're not when they are discarding you and talking about you and talking about the things that you did with them. And so it sounds like your first time was almost coerced in a way, or you felt some sort of pressure. I definitely felt pressure. I yeah. wasn't coerced by the boy. Right. But ju- I'm saying not but, him yeah. specifically, but like the definitely. situation was mm-hmm. like, environment was like, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like your little prude. So yeah. it wasn't virtuous to keep your virginity. And then my mom, when she found out, she was devastated. 
you know, she likes to say that we grew up together. Uh, she was 20 when she had me. I think she kind of knew something was going on and we were in this very friendly conversation. Our relationship was blurred a little bit like that, you know, friends. Versus mother yeah. and daughter, which happens a lot with single mothers because yes. they don't have that partnership. So mm -hmm. they become in a surrogate relationship with their children, mm -hmm. which isn't healthy either. <laughs> right. But so when I told her, you know, she kind of just asked me, where, so are you having sex? And I was like, oh, yeah. And she was like, what? And she started crying. And then she started saying I wasn't ever going to leave the house again. It just wasn't a good time. Let's talk a little bit about how your relationships with your parents, as well as your relationship with sex, how did that really manifest itself in your 20s and your 30s? What did your dating and love life look like in your 20s and your 30s based on your foundation? Um, 20s and 30s, I'm in college and I was still having casual sex. When I was in a relationship, I was completely devoted to whoever I was with. Versus um, being devoted to yourself. Basically, because when I wasn't, I would end up being with men who were with other women in other relationships. And I always would say that my responsibility was to myself and the responsibility they had was to whoever they were with. So okay. I, I would have classified myself as a man still in hoe. <laughs> okay, um, girl. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was what it was. One of the um, reasons I have you on my podcast is because you had shared that. And I thought that was so mm -hmm. amazing for you to share that yeah. I feel like we all have things that we do that sabotage ourselves depending yeah. on what issues that we have. And it is so important to be completely honest about who you are, who yeah. you were, and how you navigate this world or navigated this world, because that is the only way that you can really heal from it. So I'm so happy yeah. that you're sharing this part of your story and your life with the listeners out there, because I want them to feel empowered to be all of themselves and own all of the shit that they've done in their past as well. Good, bad, yeah. or neutral. And I've gotten some flack for that. You're you always know? gonna get flack from people and who are that. ashamed of being their authentic and true selves. i spoken from a gay man. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And this is one of the things that I've been working on. Yeah. Veils that were lifted for me. I just have to be free. Yeah. You know, I don't want anybody to hold anything over my head. The guilt that I have about things that I've done, I've forgiven myself for that. It's taken me a, a lot to forgive myself for that. Yeah. And so me sharing that on my page and the things that, that I do continue to share, it's almost like how, you know, comedians, they'll say disparaging things about themselves. It just kind of takes the edge off. It's like, you can't say nothing about me right? Uh, that I haven't already said to myself. That's very um, like eight mile. Remember when I don't know if you saw that movie, but basically at the end, yeah. Eminem raps and basically is super self disparaging about himself. And mm -hmm. so the other guy doesn't have anything oh, yeah, to say yeah, about I do him. I remember that. Because he's already told that. his all his tea and mm -hmm. spilled it all mm -hmm. over the room, right? Mm -hmm. Same mentality. So I'm coming into my own. I'm still growing up. And I think it's just real grown lady to just yeah. own your shit. Yeah. So that way you can see it and then release it. And that's yeah. a lot of what I teach women is about accountability. I just teach boundaries. You know, it's all about self and self accountability and looking at the choices that you made. Yeah, I'm just definitely. Being me. Talk to me about why you were doing the things that you were doing, right? You were calling, mm -hmm. you called yourself a side hoe. I'm not going to call you that. But what was your decision making process when you were doing these things? Understanding everything that was going on. You tell me kind of what was decision-making process in terms um, of those things. There's a feeling of, I would say, empowerment. There was a definitely a masculine go-getter energy okay. uh, to it. Definitely yes. seeking validation. Because mm. I had prided myself on being great in bed, you know. Mm -hmm. So if I lay it down a certain way, then that means he's going to want me. I put my value, my self-worth was in your was body, in it sounds like. In my body. Yeah. And I won't even say my looks as much, but definitely my sex. And I just felt like that that was what you needed to do in order to get someone. There was never an initial, like, I wasn't like going after these men that were with other people. It would be, they would come on to me. And so 
it was flattering that, oh, you like me and you already have somebody. So then they cook you. And from that point on, then it's like, well, I'm going to do what I need to do in order to keep the person. Right. So this sounds like a lot like power and control. Yeah. We talked a little bit about kind of owning your story and being accountable. What I know about the things that we do is the worst part is really the shame that comes along with it. Yeah. So can we talk about that a little bit? Like, how do we let go of that? What have you found to be really great ways to heal from some of the shame that might happen based on some of the things or relationships or men that we've experienced in our past? Well, you just got to be really, really honest with yourself. There's a level of uncomfortability that kind of has to happen in Mm -hmm. order for you to be ready to forgive yourself. And I just was tired. I was tired of the results I was getting, tired of continuing to be devalued, just really uncomfortable. And so there's a statistic that it takes an average of seven times before the woman will leave these toxic or abusive relationships. And that's because we're, we just become so attached to these people. And we're attached because we don't have any kind of self-worth or self-value, or we put all of our energy into this person. And so for me, it just had to be, I was just tired. Once I became really uncomfortable, then that's when I started to seek out help from people. And the main people that are there to help you are the ones that were telling you that you shouldn't be in this relationship. Yeah. Like your mama or, you know, your Your friends, friends. your, you know, people that you're hiding and making excuses for the relationship. So once you are ready to seek out that help, those are the people that you should seek out. And then, of course, if you're in any abusive, physically abusive relationship or emotionally abusive, emotionally, yeah, domestic violence hotline is something to reach out to. I also read lots of books and kind of immerse myself into positive things. Um, A really good book that helped me with red flags was How to Spot a Dangerous Man by Sandra L. Brown. Okay. That book right there, there's a workbook and everything that comes into it, but there's like a quiz and everything that can kind of tell you what kind of woman that you are that will be susceptible to these types of men. That was a really good book. Um, I also feel like women have this instinct as well, that they already Mm -hmm. know that these men are not going to serve them. Yeah. They're not listening to that instinct. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And why would we want to ignore this beautiful divine instinct that men do not have? (laughs) Yeah, there was plenty of times where I chose to ignore that. Women definitely have what they call women's intuition, but what happens is we end up talking ourselves out of it. There were plenty of times that you'll feel it in your chest, in your stomach, and you even will hear in your head, oh no, uh -uh." Um, Mm uh-uh. Those are the types of things, you know, at least depending upon how you receive information, you know, I'm a believer of spirituality and we all receive communication from our guides in different ways. Sometimes we'll see visions, sometimes we'll actually hear an audible words, really a feeling of not feeling good. If you're uncomfortable, that's a cue that you need to listen to. And then definitely he'll tell you what their intentions are. But then we were like, oh, well, he'll change. We, I can change him. You know, let me give him this good nookie and he'll right. be right along with me. Yeah. So definitely paying attention to negative feelings that you're having. Another good book for that is called The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker. He talks a lot about how our fear is part of that intuition that'll keep us safe. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of women feel like we're being a bitch if we say no and express boundaries. If you're not feeling comfortable, you're totally within your rights to say, no, I don't like this. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. And setting the pace in the relationship. Uh, in the very beginning, a lot of times they'll do what's called love bombing, where there's this overly affectionate, sending lots of gifts, money and praise. And you'll have this kind of intense feeling of attraction, but that's really a, a kind of a manipulation a manipulative tactic to kind of get you hooked 
So that way you can't really see who they are. So it's our responsibility as women to set the pace in relationships because you, I don't recommend having sex with anybody unless you get to know them. And it takes longer than a couple of weeks, three months. You know, you want to see how they respond in negative situations or trying situations or yeah. how they deal with things that are happening. How are they with their family members, their mother? What kind of relationships do they have? Are they working on themselves? I I'm, don't want to be with anybody that's not actively working on themselves. I, so, I totally agree with that. I want to get back to shame for a little bit because I want to connect the dots for some of our listeners out there about owning your story and the shame along with it. What mm -hmm. I'm hearing from you and what my epiphany has been and just kind of putting it all together is that to help you get out of your bad situation, you have to own the story for yourself first and foremost, yeah. even when you're in the situation, mm -hmm. right? And then yeah. once you're trying to get out of it, because it is so hard to do it on your own, you need other people to help you and support you while you're getting out of your situation. But that also requires you to own your story and tell mm -hmm. the truth about it to those people so that they can help you 100% of the way. Yeah. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're going to be stuck. That's right. Mm-hmm. What I love about you is that you own your story inside and out. And I think that is your superpower. And I hope that you're able to give that superpower to everyone else because we all need that, right? And you owning your story is the pathway to getting out of some very difficult situations, relationship or non-relationship base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like for us to tell that story to other people, for them to help us get out of it, we have to let go of the shame of that and knowing that maybe we didn't know any better because of what we knew, because of how we grew up, mm -hmm. this is what we thought was going to be a way of operating or navigating the world. One, two, yeah. as they always say, when you know better, you do better. Yeah. Right. And there's a shame about, well, I should have known better. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was, this was part of your learning experience in your journey. Right. Maybe you had to go through that experience to get to your yeah. forever person. That's where self-compassion comes in. Yeah. And the stuff that I would do, go into the mirror in the morning and I have sticky notes everywhere, praising myself. A little bit different than affirmations. I do affirmations too, but really saying the things that you wanted him or your mom or whoever to say to you, you know, I look at myself in the mirror and I'll say I am statements, but what I've found has been really powerful is saying you are. And you know? you're looking at yourself. Yes. You're looking at yourself. That's powerful. You, you That's powerful. Smiling at yourself and you're a wonderful woman, Stacy. I love you, Stacy. You can do anything that you set your mind to. Mm -hmm. Who you are and what you have to say matters. You are lovable. I love you. You're a wonderful mom. You're an awesome mom. I don't know. There's just a different energy that I yes. feel when I, I felt look at that myself. right now. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you just speaking to yourself. It feels mm -hmm. more real. It feels like you're really speaking to yourself. It feels more mm -hmm. conscious and less subconscious. Yeah. And I think sometimes we need to get conscious to get into our subconscious. You're saying that anyway, when it's negative. Why You're can't always you, messing up. Say, You're always doing. Yeah. yeah. You, why can't you get right? So I've become more aware of that. And so when I hear that, I say cancel, cancel a lot when there's something that even somebody says something to me or since some sort of negative girl, you ain't going to do this. You're not going to do that. A lot of times I'll say that to my mom, girl, well, you better watch out because blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, cancel, cancel. And then I will reaffirm myself with something else because, you know, I don't want that playing in my head. So yeah. So Stacy, you talked a little bit about, I guess, in your 20s, being the side house. So talk to me about when you got into relationships, what those relationships look like, and how you were able to kind of own your story in those relationships to help you get out of them. When I was in college, I ended up in an abusive relationship. That was my first physically abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know I got into that because, you know, I was witnessing abuse at home. 
I witnessed my stepfather being abusive to my mother as well as to me. And then there were times where me and my mother were physical with each Mm -hmm. other. And so when he came along, I found myself being attracted to the fact that he was kind of mysterious and he had his own place and everything. And he kind of chose me. It was like Mm. out of everybody, he chose me. And so I went against my intuition. And when things became uncomfortable and stayed with him, I mean, the time we had sex, well, I will say it was rape because I said no, but he pretty much forced himself on me anyway. And so Mm. dealing with that, but then I chose to stay with him after that. And you chose because... I thought he was going to be a pro football player. Okay. So I stayed thinking that purely, you know, monetary reasons. I say that was probably the first time I ever made that choice because most of the time that's just not something that would drive me, but found that kind of intriguing. You know, he was actually going football training and all of this other stuff. But I want to talk a little bit about this being chosen right? Because Mm -hmm. so many women out there are waiting to be chosen. And one Mm -hmm. of the things that I want to offer to them is that no girl, you're doing the choosing. Yeah, You choose what man you want to be with, not the other way around. If you're doing that, you've already given away all of your power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your supreme power as a woman in a female male relationship, right? And it's so interesting. And you were talking about this abuse uh, that was happening, but like, that was your model growing up. Yeah, it sounds like that mm-hmm. love, the closer people that you had in your life meant that it was going to get physical at times and that it was going to be okay afterward. Yeah, I think it was really kind of like a survival mode type yeah. of thing. Once he did choose me, I didn't feel like I had any other choice. When I decided I didn't want to be with him anymore. We had both graduated college and I was thinking, oh, I'm free. He's going to go back to his home state. But he wanted to move in together. And instead of me saying no, I said yes. And we ended up living together for about six months, which was pure hell. Things almost got so bad that my mother and father had to come and physically kind of protect me while yeah you know my whole thing was it was like this is my hometown I found the apartment and he needs to leave and she was like girl you gonna let this jigger kill you over an apartment right so it was kind of wake up call you know and then all my other friends at the time they were like girl you need to get out of the situation so I finally did leave and he left eventually but three years after that he continued to basically stalk me Mm. Um, that relationship alone pretty much set, I guess, the pace for all the other relationships that I would be in. Either they were emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, physically abusive, unavailable. Um, It's interesting because when I want to just harp on this point, because it's really important when you are chosen, then the man has Mm -hmm. all of the power. And he is going to use that power throughout the relationship because you have already let him know that you can do whatever you want because you've chosen me. And he did. Yeah. And he did. And he continued to criticize and demean and diminish. And I gave all of my power away. I, I didn't realize that I had the power to say no. Yeah. I felt like there was a certain point where you feel like, well, this is all as good as it's going to get you might as well stay here. Who else is going to want you? And so it's like, well, I might as well just kind of hang around. It it was really a brainwashing and it's familiar. It became familiar. So the other relationships, they may not be comfortable, but it's still familiar. So you continue to do the same thing, choosing different looking men, but it's really the same one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Talk to me about this notion of not being able to say no. How did this occur? Where do you think that that came from for you? Um, Seeking validation, a fear of abandonment. You know, my daddy issues, him not being there was very impactful. How did that impact you from saying yes or no? Because if I say no to what's uncomfortable, if I say no to what they want me to do, then he'll leave. leave. Yeah. He'll leave me if I don't do what what I want him to do. And that played out in my most recent toxic relationship, which was my marriage five years ago. 
there were definitely some things that I did in that relationship that I didn't feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. But again, it was that old familiar feeling. And so I got into this relationship and I was also having issues with my son. He had a lot of behavior issues. Mm -hmm. And so I was just kind of needing this man figure and I ignored all of the flags, all the red, yellow, blue flags, all of them <laughs> <laughs> and said, well, things will get better. This is good, though. He love bombed. There was a lot of love bombing. So I felt like this is the one I entered into a relationship that was not what I thought it would be, what it was going to be. And again, I did some things that I didn't want to, but thought that that's what I needed to do in order to keep my husband. Like why? And, well, I'll just say I reached out to him and told him, I said, listen, I'm not protecting you no more. I'm going to live in my truth. And Always. I'm, he was polyamorous. Okay. And I knew that. And in the beginning, it sounded like that I could have a partner. Your a cake. Eat it too. Yeah. Yeah. I could, you know. Get your and life. And the thought of that, of like, okay, it was kind of intriguing. But it didn't end up that way. Mm -hmm. And it became pressure, like couldn't go to Zumba with him, like asking if I had got a girlfriend or a boyfriend, what, you know, did anybody get your number? Did you get it? I'm like, yeah. I told you I'm open, but don't pressure me about it. So the idea of it wasn't fun anymore. And it also taught me to realize I really am a one man woman. I don't want to share you. I don't want to share myself. You know, I'm done with that. I just want to be... Here I am. I think I, I'm, I finally got this man, this monogamous relationship, and I'm still not enough. That's kind of what it boiled down to be. I wasn't enough. But the fear of me not doing what he wanted. Or else he would leave. Or else he would leave. Yeah. And he actually threatened, not, not because I wouldn't do that, but for other reasons. You know, there was always something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't do X, Y, Z, then I'm going to leave. And then... I just decided, I mean, we had went to polyamorous therapists and everything to try to, you know, coerce me into this idea of us being in this relationship. And I had tried, I felt like I did my very best, you know, before uh -huh. I could just break up, you know, but this is my husband, I can't just break up. And I just remember the conversation that me and my mother had had prior to that, because she knew that I was struggling. I wasn't able to be myself. And she just reminded me of her mother and father and she says he doesn't adore you yeah and one of my core desired feelings was wanting to be feel deeply adored and so when she said that it kind of like clicked and I was like this is fucking bullshit yeah you know here I am I'm trying to do all this stuff and it doesn't matter and then he had seen him talking to women inappropriately and I had just had enough that was my yeah. tipping point and I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I deserve better. I'm not able to be me and I'm done. And then I told him that I wanted a divorce and it was the best decision I had ever made. And I realized that I needed to get out of the relationship when I was wishing to be single. Once I finally realized that I deserved better and that I wasn't getting what I wanted, yeah. you know, I had actually took the time to write down what do I want? How do I want to feel? Yeah. And I stopped allowing him to control me and really just kept going back to what do I want? So understanding how you've been able to kind of just really own your story, how has that helped in your healing process? Well, it just really allows me to be free. One of my other core desired feelings was freedom. I want it to be free. I want to be feel alive. I want to be me. It helps me to continue to be me. And that's in all areas of my life. Any people that are around me, if I'm not able to be me, then we ain't going to be able to jail. I don't judge anybody for what they do because I done been there and done that. There's things we ain't even talked about. So I don't judge anybody for what they do. And I don't want anybody doing me like that either. So I have to live in my truth. Truth it's, is strength. Yeah. Truth is healing. It is. Tell the truth. 
Yes. So for all of the listeners out there, I want you to own your story. I want you to tell the truth about what you have done. So in your journal, take out a piece of paper and write your story down and own it, mm-hmm. own all parts of it, write all the details, even the details you haven't told anyone before. Yeah. After you are done writing a specific instance, experience, relationship, whatever it may be, I want you to tell that to a friend of yours, someone mm-hmm. you trust someone you feel safe with, because if you're, you are in the practice of doing that, when you are in these situations, it'll be that much easier to be able to tell the truth and to get out of them. Owning your story is the pathway of strength healing as well. Mm -hmm. With that being said, Stacey, how can my listeners get in contact with you if they want to work with you, if they want to learn more about what you do and how you take these women and you heal them and you make sure that they are owning all of themselves? I have a free Facebook group that they can join. It's called Stop Dating Toxic and Unavailable Men. We'll make it real simple for you. Yes, God. <laughs> and uh, and then I'm not on IG as much, but you can reach me there at I underscore am underscore Stacy Robinson. Stacy with an E. Yes. Awesome. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been truly amazing, and I know for a fact that there are going to be so many women out there. Their minds have just been blown just by this conversation of understanding not just you owning your story fully, but understanding why you've done the things that you've done. They'll be able to see themselves in you and know that what they are going through is what so many other people go through. I just think it's so inspirational, not just that you've gone through it and you've owned your story, but that you've been able to go on the other side. And you've also been able to be really honest about the work doesn't stop, that you continue working and you continue striving for the person that you want to be. I love that. And I love your honesty. And I'm so honored that you have been on this podcast with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was really, really healing. I hope that your listeners will gain everything that my intention is for them to have. Love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, girl. Thank you so much for listening to the Get Your Guy Coaching Podcast. If you like this episode and want to talk with me personally, please book a free consultation at www.getyourguycoaching.com slash apply or subscribe and leave me a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Talk soon. Talk soon.